No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today I'm in here with Big Trey D. How you feeling, my guy? Oh, man, what's up, dudes, dudes? I'm good, man. <laughs> Yo, it's nice to have you in here, man. It's it's, uh, it's very good. This has always been like my goal with the podcast. I'm going to interview all these young-ass dudes, get a name for myself, and then I'm going to double back and interview everybody I listened to when I was in elementary school and high school and shit. That's guys. That's guys. <laughs> Dude, step and stone platform. You feel me? Mm-hmm. Um, man. Let's just start talking about this memory that we were just uh, taking in together. We were watching this video on YouTube. If you search Trady 2003, it comes right up. It was just you. It was, was it right before you caught the case that had you go away for like 10 years? Or, or what was that time period was? Um, that was approximately a year or so before I actually uh, caught the case. I think that was in if if that was in 2003, it was at the very beginning. Time was moving so fast then, mm. it could have been. But um, I believe it was either 2002, around that time. Um, it was it was wild, man. The streets was popping, you know, everywhere you went, you know, you, you, you if you was pushing that gangster lifestyle, you know, you had to really be represented mm. on the 24-hour level. Which and, is interesting because when I think about you and your career, I mean, 2003, you'd been around for a while by that point. It's not like you were a spring chicken at that point, but you, yeah. were, you were still very much getting it in right there. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, because that's where I come from. You know, I come from the streets. I come from getting down with the, uh, you know, with the, with the gangster lifestyle real heavy. So that's always expected when somebody meets me. It's like, you know, I've had people approach me at, uh, Universal Studios and like you know they with their homeboys and they hit me up with they set and be like yeah what that whoop de whoop like really? and I bang my set back and they be like that's right cuz that's right I knew it and I knew you was a real one you know because a lot of times when people do that and you be like oh okay that's cool no that's not how you present yourself you know you present yourself like you know you're gonna represent yourself at all times where you from right and i didn't i didn't did that and that's that's just so expected that to reflect on that and see that going on at that time it let me see what kind of mind frame i was in Mm. you know and to me when i'm looking at that i'm just seeing the way that shit was before the internet in the sense that that footage got a chance to rock you didn't see it for a long time you know just the fact that there was just the look of that club that you were in it looked like everybody was having such a good time they didn't all have their phones out it was a very different atmosphere even though it was only i mean it was 16 years ago feels like a fucking it was just the other day but it also feels like it was a million years ago like it was a lifestyle ago it does it really does that was actually a boat party See, that's interesting too. Yeah, that in Long was, Beach. Yeah, yeah. Queen we, Mary. We pulled off. Yeah, we pulled off. No, it wasn't at the Queen Mary. Okay. It was uh, it was over, it was over by the little docking area by the West Coast Inn. I think they changed the name of that hotel, but um, we launched off from over there, and you know, it was free drinks and you know, free food, and you know, just come out and party with the homies, you yeah. know. And uh, my boy Dale Dog, rest in peace, from Main Street, and he he uh, orchestrated that. that was, he put that together. That was fire. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I lived in, just to, to make it clear, I lived in Long Beach, like, 2010 to 2014. So that's one thing. When I'm watching all your videos and stuff, it's it's, it's very dope to get to see that, that impression of Long Beach. In particular, I was just watching you and Stupid Young doing the video together and shit, and that was dope because that was right where I was staying in Cambodia town. Right, right, yeah. Shout out to Stupid Young, yeah. solid little homie. Yeah, uh, yeah. So shout out to P. Nice as well. Mm. Um, yeah, man. I'm. I just love the city, man. I always represent the city and push the city. And I know that we weren't included a lot in the early stages of hip hop on the West Coast because before Snoop Dogg, it really was no. MC that was powerful enough to represent Long Beach. Right. And when he got on and he made the way for all of us, you know, we've been proud to push the LBC. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because for me, 
the Snoop Dogg story and everything related to that has always been one of the most interesting plot lines in hip hop because that was like the first, you know, you know, like I knew about rap pretty much since I can remember anything, but the Snoop Dogg thing was a different thing because when Snoop came out, all of a sudden this was just like the coolest motherfucker in the world to in me. the entire world. <laughs> so no you, you, you were thinking the same thing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the entire world, yeah, yeah. His whole style and approach was unique. Right. You know? I feel like I kind of understand where little kids are coming from when they when they look at a little pump or whoever they're looking up to. Right. It's like that was what Snoop Dogg was to me because I'd never seen somebody that tall with the cool ass afro, the long ass flannel shirt. I didn't really know what the blue bandanas was about and shit, but I just right. knew that this was just like the coolest dude I ever seen <laughs> yeah. in like 92. Yeah, yeah. And I was on my way out of prison at that time. Oh, okay. And we hadn't met. Because you're older than him? Before, yeah, okay. I'm older than Snoop. And we hadn't met at that time, and people were coming into prison at that time, and they was like, man, your homeboy Snoop Dogg, man, he out, man, he's so hard, and man, that, and I'm like, Snoop Dogg? I'm like, Snoop Dogg? You know, he was a few, he's a few years younger than me. Right. So, I'm like, okay. So when I get out and we ran across each other, it turned out that his uncles used to be hanging with my big brother. Okay. You know, so it was a connection there. But we just had now, because he was going to school and hanging with, you know, Warren and Nate Dogg. Them was his peers then. Right. You know, and they was pretty close. And I was heavy in the streets. I was mm-hmm. a little bit more heavy in the streets. But, uh, yeah, when I did finally hear him, I said, yeah, this is a bad motherfucker right here. <laughs> so when you, when you were growing up in Long Beach, would you... Was that the feeling in Long Beach? Was that you guys were sort of excluded from the like narrative of what LA hip hop was at that time before Snoop came out? Like Long Beach wasn't really being counted or represented in that whole equation? No, no. Well, I didn't feel like that and I don't believe anyone felt like that okay. because we didn't have any artists at that time that was really clamoring to get on to right. push Long Beach. You know, like wasn't no doors being closed to Long Beach or nothing like that. I don't, we just weren't prominent on the hip hop scene. And people mm. probably rapped and walked around rapping in school and stuff like that and rapping on the streets. You know, me and my homeboy, um, little half head, we used to, you know, play EPMD music and freestyle over that and stuff like that. But I don't think anyone really pursued rap with the passion that Snoop Dogg did. So we weren't ready to really even hit the map then. Mm-hmm. It was probably somebody that can spit a couple of songs, but that's where where then you have to be. To have his catalog and, you know, his ability to continuously invent great music, you have to be kind of born for it. Right. You know, and it's good that he did open the door for us because that's like the the paradigm for Long Beach. You right. know what I'm saying? To you know, can he? You know, Snoop Dogg. We know Snoop Dogg from Long Beach. Who who else? You know, it's right. like who else? You know, so he's like the standard bearer. What was your perspective on N.W.A. as a kid? Was that something that you were just watching and and trying to wrap your head around as a youngin? Mm, well, we right next to Compton. Right. Long Beach. So we ventured into Compton regularly and we knew what was going on. You know, we had our dope dealing out there and, you know, hustling and low riders and Jerry curls and every mm. pretty much everything NWA was pushing. But for them to vocalize the lifestyle of LA per se, the way that they did from Compton, Mm. you know, but Ice Cube was from L.A. at the time, and he is from L.A., but for him to unite with them and for them to represent, Compton is known as a notorious hub of Los Angeles County, so for them to come out so brazen and blatant as they did, you know, it was it was just inspiring to to feel like that 
you could be a gangster and be successful. Mm. That's that's how that's how it hit me. Because this is like the early days of like hip hop as a whole forming in California. So it's like that that must have sort of made every different neighborhood start to look at it as like, oh, this is a possibility for me to come out and do something. But they also had a very like political edge to the way that they were uh, coming out lyrically and shit. Yeah, the, the, I think the politics came into play later on. Mm, you know, this the, is true. Yeah, you know the the fuck the police that launched you know the the full notoriety across America and all that. That wasn't even. I don't even think that was meant to be a political statement. It right. was a rap song. Mm. You know, like man, fuck these motherfuckers, man. You know, and it just caught on like that because they took offense. Well, the police, you know, all law enforcement took offense. We protecting the country and we, well, y'all not protecting us. Mm. You know, y'all harassing us and, you know, kind of like lit a fire in a political arena. But, you know, I think they was just coming from the heart making the song. Like, man, these motherfuckers steady fucking with us, man. Fuck them. Yeah. You know? It's interesting to think that, like, fuck the police is probably like the most common sense average thought process for somebody who's growing up in the hood but then meanwhile when white america heard that song it was like everything that they knew was being questioned and thrown into jeopardy you know right 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 because they're I like that, that's that. who's stopping my house from getting burglarized <laughs> at night in their mind it's like how could anybody hate the cops like that you know? right right but I mean, even even white America knows that, you know, even from, you know, the Irish cops in New York, you know, to, to the, you know, to the to the whole structure of law enforcement, you know, they got their own blue wall of silence. They got kind of like a gangster lifestyle mm. to, to how they push, too, because it's them against, you know, all the criminal element, as they say. Yeah. And if you don't fall on the side of. Go police, then you know you part of the criminal element. And, and shit's crazy because I've talked to people who are like close family members of cops or whatever, and they they told me that it's very much like a culture of extreme laziness where anybody who bites off more than they have to in terms of the workload of that department mm -hmm. is looked upon like an asshole. Like you you, you want to look into the stuff that you have to look into, like say that the department's being judged on however many murders they, they, they have that year or whatever. It's like, but anybody who comes in and tries, starts trying to do more is really looked down upon because, you know, there's, there's infinite crime. Right, like, if right. you were a cop, you could think of five million crimes that are going on here. People speeding, not to mention all the drugs, not to mention everything. So it's very much on them to decide what they want to go after. So then all the other cops are looking at them as, why the fuck are you making it harder on us? Why are you making it so we have to do more paperwork? <laughs> right. Take, uh, getting, getting, overseeing every little detail and little minor issue. Yeah. Well, that's how, you know, that's the general feeling in the ghetto, you know, when you see... They got more cops that patrol ghetto areas and urban areas than they do suburban areas. Mm. And why? Because if anybody looks suspicious out there, not supposed to be out there, the citizens are going to call the police mm. <laughs> more faster. Right. You know, and it's like, you know, and it's it's also a fear and intimidation tactic. Mm. You know, we're right here watching you. You know, don't move, don't breathe wrong, don't you know? And you know, it's it's all a it's all a psychological um, strategy. You know, I believe from the government, and it's just based on how you view them as how you understand what their purpose is. Mm. Definitely. What, when you think about your childhood growing up in Long Beach and everything, what, what what's your perspective on how, like in retrospect, your perspective on how all of that shit was, how the cops treated you, how much violence you were surrounded by having all these years? What? Tell me a little bit about your childhood and, and how you viewed the environment you grew up in. Hmm, that was a good question. Um, a little the, rambling. Yeah, no, that was a good question. No, I dig that. Um, the environment I grew up in was, it was rough, but at the same time, it was a lot of camaraderie mm. amongst the citizens of the community. And, you know, if you, you know, I, I grew up doing bad shit, you mm. know, robbing people, you know, snatching purses, uh, you know, 
the whole gamut. You know, I really wasn't a dope dealer, but I've sold dope. And it's just like you pitting yourself against the law at that point. So I understood that. The only time I really felt victimized by the police was, the, like I said, their presence, their ever presence in everything going on in the inner city. But, you you know, you don't hear about meth labs getting raided the way you hear crack houses getting batter rammed and mm. things like that. So I, I was there when they came with the batter ram. Right. You know, I wasn't there when they brought the batter ram out, but the year that they brought the batter ram out, I was, you know, I was around. Right. And, you know, it was just... It's just how they, it's just how the police browbeat and oversee the urban environment without ever trying to develop an understanding and a relationship with the people unless they're trying to get you to tell on somebody or they see some little kids and be like, hey, you guys need to stay in school, don't be around here doing this and that. But they micromanage the job that they're doing, like you say, and piss other people off, like, man, let's just do the jobs, like get the murderers and the robbers and things like right. that. And it just, and it's gotten worse now because now they begin, you know, outright killing young black males, unarmed, you know, uh, women disappearing off the streets, found hanged in jail cells, things like that. And it's like, if I can't trust you to protect me or at least not get off my ass, I can't even pr trust you now not to kill me. Right. So that, that has been pretty much pervasive since my childhood and my understanding of the police was to avoid them at all costs. Don't talk to them. Don't trust them. You know. Did your parents tell you that or did you have to figure that out on your own? Well, I never knew my dad. Okay. So, you know, my mom... She was kind of like the law of the household. She was the law of the household. And outside of that, what I went and exposed myself to was nothing that she led me to. So she didn't know my inter what my interaction was going to be like with law. Right. So she never instilled that in me, mm. you know. But based on the, the, the path that I chose, that was the understanding amongst my peers. Right. And, you know, those that I encountered... Right. You know, my role models and things like that. It was like, we don't fuck with the police. Was your mom trying hard to keep you out of trouble and it just didn't work? Yeah, she tried hard with all of us. Right. But, you know, she had her own situation to deal with as well, being, you know, you know, being a woman with six children. Right. That, you know, she left St. Louis to come to California and make a better life for us. So, you know, and she was dealing with her own personal crisis in her life at different times, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I mean, I get it, you know what I'm saying? I get it. So, you know, I don't hold her, I can't say she, she molded my thinking into not liking the police or nothing, but she was always a realist and she always let me know that whatever I was doing, I should protect myself and be cautious whoever I dealt with. Right. So... Did you, were you the oldest, the youngest, in the middle? The baby. The baby. The baby. How do you see that having impacted you? Like, you know, the, people always talk about how the, the youngest one is the one who has the least guidance because the, the parent is being the most strict with their first child. And then by the end, their last child, they're, they're not really paying as much attention because they've sort of accepted at a certain point, like, the kid's going to come out how he comes out. So I, I, it's not really a reason for me to micromanage every part of his life. Is that how you feel when you look at your childhood? Not at all. No? I, no, not at all. I, you know, I was I was my mother's baby. Okay. You know what I mean? And uh, The last chance that she had right there, too. So that makes sense, too. You know, and well, she didn't she didn't really know because she was still mm. she I think she was probably in her 40s when she had early 40s or late 30s or something. And um 
you know, fresh in California, you know, ain't no telling what what her life could have turned out like had she pursued another that she worked at the VA hospital though mm -hmm. and um, you know, she provided for us and everything. But you know, I'm just I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful that I had somebody in my life that cared enough about me that she, she didn't she didn't treat me no different than any other the ki uh, any other the kids in the house but she gave me a special love as the baby and I I took advantage of that in different ways but mm. not not in the way of a spoiled brat or something I just took it to want my own independence more right you know what I mean like cuz I seen my brothers having their own independence and right. my sisters you know my older sisters doing you know doing what they did and then my youngest sister to me is four years older than me right so i was really like the baby you mm -hmm. know because she at some point she used to help watch me and stuff like that so i had watching them i developed my own sense of wanting to be independent and wanting to call my own shot so that's why i started going hanging out with different people and doing different things right that that was against what she wanted me to do and against the law. When you look back at your childhood, were you in the streets before you started really thinking about rapping? Was oh, rapping man. not a serious thing in, for a long time? I was in the streets at 10, Ten. 9. Jeez. Yeah, you know, in the streets doing shit, you know. And, uh, yeah, gang banging at 11. Right. You know, um, so it's it's been... It's been a, a journey for me in that lifestyle, <laughs> way away from me, even you know, concentrating on like, you know, different variations of family life and what I went through and what I was understanding. I was trying to get in the streets at a young age. Right. You know, I was trying to get out there and see what was going on, what was happening. Were you I just curious? My own money. I was curious. Or would you, were you really like thinking about the money side of things? Like, I want to be independent. I don't I have to rely on anybody. I was curious and I was, I had a thirst for knowing shit. Mm. And I picked up things easily. Curiosity killed the cat. Yeah, I, you know <laughs> what I mean, I wasn't in the house trying to play with no coloring books and right. you know do homework and stuff like. I got kicked out of school in the third grade. Third grade? Yeah. What for? Fighting the teacher. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah she they don't won. like that. She, she won. won. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Cat, shout out, Mr. Cat. You're won. like, I'm never gonna let a girl <laughs> win against me again. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> she got me you though, know, but uh, yeah, man. So. I went to a couple of um, continuation schools and mm. things like that for a month or two here and there. And, you know, I was getting caught with weed and, you know, switch blades and things like that. So I was always kind of like dealing with the law. It's good to know that the weed is the one thing that's never changed with you, right? Oh, man. This, <laughs> this is it. This is it. And, you know, now that, you know, I don't mix it with alcohol or anything else, right. you know, psychotropic, psychedelic, or none of that, right. you know, it just, it, it keeps me in a more calm state to process things and act a little more calmly now that I know. Right. I used to be kind of like impulsive and, you know. A little bit more on edge. It translates in my music. You Same. Know? Yeah. No, I, I think about quitting weed sometimes just because, you know, I, with the working out and everything, sometimes I feel like, you know, it, it's holding me back a little bit in terms of my cardio ability and shit. My right. girlfriend is the number one person that does not want me to stop smoking weed because she's like, you're a fucking asshole a lot of times when you ain't smoking weed, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. And sometimes when yeah. I be off, you know, because I quit smoking once upon a time mm. and you know, I know how I was real anal about a lot of things. I so. get so organized and straight up and <laughs> agitated. If somebody say one thing to me I don't like, I just get mad as fuck. You know, there's, there's no barrier between me and my, like, overtly analytical side when I'm not smoking weed. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah, that's understandable. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I, nah, this, this has never changed with me, man. The weed has gotten better and, mm. you know, 
the, the ways of smoking has changed. I was tripping off when you said you don't uh, really get out with wax. I was watching one of your interviews. You was like, you don't need to get that high. I was watching, uh, or I was interviewing Lil Flip, and he, he's smoking a joint at noon, and it's got crazy moon rocks in it. I'm, I'm smelling it burn, and I'm realizing he's smoking this big old moon rock thing. I'm like, God damn. That's a lot for noon. Yeah. Moon rocks yeah. are serious. That's a lot to bite off. It is. It is. Shout out, Corrupt. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'm waiting on, my, on some of my sun rocks now. You know, I got that cracking as well. Right. Um, it's, it's just a mixture of Keef. Sun and rocks. rocks. Okay. Sun rocks. Yeah, it's, it's devastating. Damn, really? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's devastating. <laughs> That's no good bullshit. to know. So you, you mentioned, like, catching your case before you even knew about Snoop Dogg. What, what age were you when that happened? Well, this was the case that I caught, the last case I caught, it was a, a violation. I think it was for a robbery. Okay. A armed robbery that the people didn't come to court on. And um, I wound up doing a violation. Okay. Which was the rest of my time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was 1992. Uh -huh. So I was, I maxed out. I missed the riots. Oh, wow. You know, I got locked up in about February. And I did the time, and I maxed out in the end, about the middle or the end of, July, of uh, December. And I got out in 92, and I ran across um, Snoop in somewhere in 93, towards the middle or the end of 92. So what was it like hearing about the L.A. riots while you were locked up? Because I'm sure everybody you were locked up with was mad as shit that they couldn't get out there and see what the fuck was going on, right? Man, watching that on the news, man, you know, I I'm going to tell you something about being detached from it. You see the devastation mm. as well as you... You know, when you're in the middle of it and you're living it, it's probably so chaotic and so wild at the time that it's like, you know, man, we can get this and they're not protecting this and let's go have this and grab that and take that. You're living in the moment. Right. But when you're actually watching it take place and you're seeing things burning and you're seeing assaults and you're seeing, you know, the, the all, martial law and all this, it's like, it's like, man, this is fucking nuts. Oh, yeah. But it must have felt good, too, to at least, like, even though we know that, you know, our riot is ultimately not really productive and a lot of the people who are getting hurt with, like, the local community, the local business owners that didn't really do anything to anybody. But just being that you had been, like, the victim of so much intense policing and had witnessed so much bullshit, it must have felt like, because to a certain extent. I don't think we got them. I don't think we got the police. Right, I don't no. think they. I don't think no. I don't think they suffered from that. Right. Too bad. But that they was the idea. They still got their salary. Right. Yeah, you know I'm saying none of them got fired. Probably got a whole lot of overtime, of got, really. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, so they they exactly that's the point. <laughs> they probably had more overtime, so they they benefited the most mm. out of all that destruction and chaos. But at least it was like something, because to a certain extent, you growing up The only thing was the peace treaty. Oh, okay, so that came out after. But let me just ask this, is that, so so just being in the hood, it's like you must have really felt like, to a certain extent, that you, you were voiceless. Like nobody was gonna listen to you complain. So then all of a sudden, it might have been, you know, shooting at the Korean guy who fucking owns the corner store, or it might have been, you know, uh, all kinds of violence, burning down buildings and stuff, but it must have still at least felt like, well, at least we're capable of doing something that will get on the news because to a certain extent, you must have felt like you didn't have a voice. I'm always with rebellion and revolution. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that I condemn what took place in no way. I'm just saying that you perceive it different. Mm. When, you, when you're in the middle of it, participating in it, which I was unable to be. Right. Then when you're detached from it, watching it on the screen, watching it unfold, watching them set up to go in, watching, you know, uh, this this place of business burning that these people had nothing to do with, you know what I'm saying? Mm. They losing everything, you know, and it was just, it was just like a putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot, mm. you know? That's how I seen it. Definitely. It was like an overflowing of emotion that didn't have anywhere to go. You know? It was like there was just so much anger and it was an implosion. Yeah. Instead of an explosion. Right, it was insular, yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, 
I probably wouldn't feel like that if I was out there then because I probably would have went in a couple of the right places and extracted some of the right stuff that would have set me up for a good while instead of going to grab liquor and yeah, you, you know, probably would have had a nice tv uh, but, you, know, <laughs> you dig it and tv would have automatically yeah. got upgraded right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's that's probably what it took place with me but when i when i was gone and i seen it, and then when i got out you know it was dog was popping so you know, I kind of merged with him within like the first year. How did that relationship sort of take take shape? Did did he look at you as just like a somebody who was a little bit more streetwise, a little bit more tapped in on the street level that he needed? No, I got I got vouched for it by Big C Style from 19th Street, and okay. Big C Style was like, you know, one of the he was the pretty much the main enforcer mm. on on. Uh, on the DPG right then, besides Nate Dog, Nate Dog was enforcer itself. Really? Rest in peace. But so Nate, Nate Dog was, was he Nate was Dog. harder than we gave him credit for as fans. I don't. I think people gave him kind of credit for <laughs> okay. being a gangster though. But, but he was so of, early as a singer, you know. Uh, man, Nate was the real. Really, Nate okay. was the real authentic. That's good to know. I should look into him more. Like I, I never really thought about that side of him besides yeah. just the music. Yeah, solid, solid all the way around. Wow. And, uh, you know, so when he vouched for me, when, when C-Style vouched for me and he brought Snoop, well, I met Snoop, and then he brought him over my house later on a couple months after, about a month or so after, uh, when he said he wanted to do a song. When I met him, we was out in front of a club and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I still really didn't know who he was because all I knew about rap was like Eric B and Rakim and mm. you know EPMD and Too Short. You were still looking at New York as real rap. That was like the rap industry. No, the I looked at Easy Ice Cube, you know King T. You know I, I knew who I knew who the the rappers were in 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 on the West Coast. Um, you know all the way to to the click. Right. You know, E-40 in the click up in the bay. You know, up Sebo, all that. I knew we had some hitters, but it was like I didn't know the impact that Snoop had made when mm. he came out. I still wasn't aware of that because I was just coming home from a prison sentence. Mm, you miss so much when you're away, too, like that, right? You, you, you come home and it's just like all oh, this crazy in information prison, coming you're in. You're dealing with what's going on right there on the mm. yard and all that. You're really not, oh, man, this is new rap out here and all that. Man, yeah, okay, could you send me $50 so <laughs> yeah. I can get me some lotion and shit, and <laughs> a cup of noodles and shit? So, you know, it, I, I really didn't know, but when I got linked up with him and seen – the impact that he had across the board, people were sampling in his music, mm. like a, 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 a Biggie and Red Man, and you know they would actually actually sample his music mm. on their albums and stuff like that, and it was like, damn, you know, this they really, you know, they really fucking with dog. Right. So you know, it was like, okay, this is this is pretty big. Then when I was actually brought into it. On the murder was the case soundtrack, right. which I think was the first time I ever heard you as a kid. Yeah, yeah, that was that was my debut, I believe. Right, that was around the same time as the show with dropping bombs I did with South Central on right, there. Yeah, but yeah. that didn't. I don't think that album. I know that album wasn't as impactful. Impacted, mm. yeah, as impactful on the West Coast as. The uh, murder was the case soundtrack. Yeah. So that's when people like really like, oh, okay. And then I was able to get on the Dog Pound album. And then we did the um, LBC crew, uh, Beware of My Crew thing. And it was in the movie with uh, Martin Lawrence, uh, the thin line between love and hate, Martin Lawrence and Bobby Brown. And, right. we, and we got to perform in the movie. So that was kind of like my introduction into the game. And I seen just how being linked up with him, things were just happening. Mm. We were still trying to put together an album at the time. Right. And and it just came about that, you know, in doing the work, other opportunities and avenues of, and I was recording with Roger Troutman, and rest in peace and all that, and it was like, 
that was phenomenal to me. I grew up off Zap and Roger, so okay, you know. When, who told you to rap, or who who put that idea in your head that you could be a rapper as well and not just one of the homies around him? Oh, I did. Oh, okay. You already had that plan yeah. while you were in jail, or after you yeah, got I out? Yeah, I was writing. I've been writing rhymes since 1988. Oh, okay, cool. You know, just when I would go to jail, I would spend my time, you know, studying, you know scheming, writing up rhymes, you know, and politic and doing what I had to do to stay solid. But, you know, I knew, I, I, I knew deep, deep in the recesses of my mind if I ever had a chance to showcase that I could put lyrics together, I would be able to. Mm. But I never actually thought that it would take place, that right. I would get the opportunity to rap for anyone on a commercial level to where it would get exposed to the world. Right. You know, this was it was more like a hobby. Because mm -hmm. it must have just seemed like rappers were superheroes at that time because there were so few people that you had really yes. gotten famous as rapping because it wasn't like now where everybody we know has a crappy ass rap song on their <laughs> SoundCloud that nobody gives a fuck about it. <laughs> That's the most normal thing in the world now. Yeah, 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 it was, it yeah. was, you know, you because you only had certain people that, like I named about eight of them, but now it's, it's many more than that, yeah. you know, uh, many, many, many more. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time to be in hip hop then because the, learning it and getting to collaborate with everybody who was popping, you know, from Exhibit to mm. Sugar Free, you know what I'm saying, to the newcomers like, you know, the Doggies Angels, you know, to, uh, the, you know, the Lost Angels, you know, that was my boy King Lou, rest in peace, and, mm -hmm. you know, Ruffiano, and it was like, it was... It was just everything that was hot at that time. It was like bring the heat to the table, mm. and we gon' and we gon' make it make it swing. <laughs> we are gonna let them see what we do. So was it an odd situation at that time because Snoop was dealing with his murder case on like during the the thing that that album that you've kind of made your debut on mm -hmm. that was like roughly based on Snoop's legal situation at that time. Was that something that was like an overwhelming concern at the time? Mm, well, I think when when me and him talked about it, when I asked him about it, I believe that he said, I'm going to beat this shit, D. Okay, so he was confident. Yeah, he said, he said I'm going to beat this shit, D. You know, and, you know, he, he, he embraced me as not like an artist initially. It was like, you, you the big homie, you part, and you're going to be part of the squad. Right. So, you know, it's never been a relationship like, you know, uh, I'm I'm trying to come get studio time mm. from him or, you know, locate where they were or whatever. It's like, we here, we doing this, this going on, let's get this done. Let's, you know, I'm pulling <clears throat> up over here. You want to go out here with me? We finna tour. You know, I have been all around the world, mm. you know, um, on, on some of his tours with him and... You know, it, it just took me from one world to a whole nother world. Right. And, you know, I, um, I lasted, you know, in 11 years, you know, just grinding and putting it in before I caught my case that took me away for 10 and a half years. And I've been home for like over five years now. Yeah, so that's, yes. that's how you like break up your life basically is that you had this like 10, 11 year stretch of putting in work as a traveling rapper slash supporting other rappers, all that shit, and then that was like the end of that era is when you caught that additional case. It was over. Mm. Yeah, that was done. Right. Yeah, that was done. We still had a couple of projects that we had in mind to, to push, and, you know, thankfully I had loved ones that kept, kept me alive in the memory of hip-hop, you know, my wife Cognac, one of them, you know, she she pushed the free big trade these shirts her and you know she have her cousins with her and they be pushing. Shout out to Crooked Eye. She held you down the whole time. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah, the whole get down. How long have you been together before you went in? Well, I believe our child was probably like about she was about like six or seven. Wow. 
at that time. That's got to be a, a small percentage of guys who go into prison and then leave and still have the same girlfriend that they went in with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you, you can't blame them either. Well, when we, yeah, when we decided that, you know, it was going, we was going <clears> to <throat> be together and get through the time together mm -hmm. and, you know, we was going to march together after all this was said and done, then, you know, it was, it was just, you know, just, just get to the task. Right. Let's get to the task of getting past the time. Was it like, it must have been so different for you going in to do that 10 years, given that you had seen a lot, done a lot, been around the world, had all these experiences versus average person who's in prison ain't seen or done shit besides what's around them when they're, <laughs> when they're born. Right. You ain't bullshit. I got a friend of mine yeah. who's like a pro BMX rider and he was telling me about being in prison. He's like, He's like, bro, you don't understand. He's like, all I got to do is talk about being in Paris. He's yeah. like, ain't none of these dudes been to Paris. I've been to Paris a couple of times. They're looking at me like I'm a fucking genius or some shit. <laughs> That's the truest shit in the world. <laughs> you know, people that, you know, you had to separate yourself from a lot of people because all they want to do is hear the stories and be around you so they can write their people. Yeah, I'm hanging around Trey D every mm. day. That's my boy, you know, this, that, and the other. So you, run, you encounter a lot of that, but... Nah, just, yeah, it was devastating, you know, on the real, Adam, on the real. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, once this is over with, I got to figure out how to never put myself in this position mm -hmm. again. And, you know, that started, that started with realizing that I was in a position in my life at one time to have whatever I really desired, and I didn't treasure it and value it as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what goes through your mind when you're watching that clip from 2003 is that those are good times, but at the same time, the way you were living at that time was just not a, a long-term plan? It was. It right. was. I mean, I was, yeah, I was full throttle. It was like I couldn't separate. I could, I didn't want to. I could, but I didn't want to separate the success from the streets. Right. It's like. I'm going to stay real to both of them. Mm. And you either got to choose one or the other. You right. can't serve two masters. And that's what the problem when you become like a famous gangster is that. It is. It's, it's like, a big problem because yeah. you deal with the streets still. Mm -hmm. You're still going to deal with the streets. You know, because. I, I was just reading this article about Nicky Barnes mm -hmm. and how he was on the cover of, I think, the New York Times. And that, the, the, and the whole thing was like, can the police catch him or whatever and that's what made the president get so interested in his situation that ultimately got him caught up mm -hmm. like the fact that he was willing he was so cocky that he was willing to go on the cover of a fucking newspaper to say like y'all can't make a case against me that's crazy i mean the same thing when they put john Gotti on the cover of time right who wants to really be that big of a gangster everybody really does when they start off truthfully mm -hmm. You know that's your aspiration when you when you pushing that gangster lifestyle. It's like I want my when my name is said, I want people to fear it. I want people to respect it. You know, and I want I want doors to open and motherfuckers damn near to bow down and curtsy when I step in the <laughs> joint. That's you like know? the initial uh, dream before you realize that that's kind of not the dream. That the dream is to have money and to be able to take care of yourself and not have to worry about shit. But <laughs> yeah. that just being feared is to a lot of people. That's their like initial goal in a way. But you know, to to me, my program has never been pushed to where I've been trying to strike fear in people. It's just that you know that if we go to that position in the game where we opposing each other, you already know what I'm going to come with. So if you want to come with that, then let's go there. Mm. You know, let's not, you know, let's not play games with it. You know, I'm not going to talk about you behind your back. I'm not going to try to, you know, take over your spot. I'm not going to try to steal your girl. I'm not one of them kind of people. I've never been one of them kind of people. I ain't going to snake you. If my relationship with you is solid and is real, it's going to be real, and especially if you're my homeboy. Mm. You know what I mean? So I'm going to give you that level of love and loyalty. Apart from that, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's like I don't want nobody to fear me. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to fear because I want you to understand that you don't have nothing to fear from me except you trying to fuck over me. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe when you become smart and wise enough 
to to be able to make that balance to where you don't have to do crazy shit to to, to have motherfuckers like oh shit I can't do that to him he might do this and that they just know you know like I believe at that time people knew Trady keep a gun on him at all times so if whatever you going to do whatever however it's going to go just know that just know that and he don't he don't be flashing it he don't do all that it was actually slipping in my slacks at the time you know i had the suit on so i had digested and he caught me in the moment mm. and that just happened to go viral i guess from that time oh really okay yeah, that's yeah, what that wasn't was like hey let me show y'all my gun right you know not a, I, that's goofy shit. so much shit is based on reputation just in the sense that you know we we all know dudes who that's what people say about him when people bring him up it's like that dude got it on him all the time and especially like I know a dude who's who's doing like at least eight years right now. He's in New York City, and mm-hmm. that's what people would always say with him is like this fool. Every single time you ever seen him, he had it on him, and it's just that that right there that amplified his reputation like in my head. And I'm a grown ass man that is not a gangster and has no reason to really be thinking about shit in this context. But that made me think like, bro, that dude is wild as hell. Like he's yeah. nobody should fuck with him because he's he's ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. If you're not gonna play, if you're not gonna play right by his rules, you know, not that you have to conform to my rules, but you know what my rules are to fuck with me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's a certain level of loyalty, certain level of loyalty that's going to be expected. Mm. You know, it's going to be a certain level of trust that I'm going to have to be able to confide in you. You Something might go down, I might have to snatch you and we might have to go handle some business and leave that where it is. So... If I can't if I can't really confide and count on you in that for that, then you probably don't even want to entertain me. Mm. You you probably you know no nah, I ain't gonna fuck with D on that level because you know what I feel like this right now but I probably ain't gonna feel like this in a few days but I know him he ain't gonna let it go mm. you know what I mean so that's all it is man just staying raw and real definitely. Are you able to talk about the situation of why you did the 10 years? Can you tell that that story a little bit? Uh, Yeah, it was just a situation where some guys pulled up on me and, you know, they was playing and I wasn't. Oh, okay. You know, and, uh, you know, they stopping by my car and, you know, flexing and, you know, exposing and. I just wasn't having none of it, so okay. you know I sent them on their way, and they way happened to be straight to the gang enforcement and say, "Oh, Trady, he did this and that," and you know, and they came over there, and some people at the barber shop around there confirmed the story. Oh, we saw him coming out over there, and yeah, we heard it, and then he pulled off, so everything was corroborated. By the time I made it home that night, you know, I was coming out the shower and it, they was coming up with beams and all that and wow. you know had my family downstairs and you know they looked for the gun they they found a few is a few that weapons. is that the kind of situation that you'd been through like many times in your life but you never thought that that was the kind of situation you would get caught up with because you're just not used to dudes popping shit and then going straight to the cops yeah, I mean, no, the situation definitely that's that's happened a few times, you know, where you had to be like, man, boy, quit playing with me, right? You know, but yeah, to I never imagined that they would tell, they would go tell like that because they initiated exactly the yeah. whole get down. So I said, wow, they playing a whole different game out here now. So you know, I I took steps to safeguard myself since then. But you had no chance of getting off on self defense or anything. They weren't trying to hear it. Um, insane crip since 1977. You've been to prison seven times, eight times. Yeah, uh, you've been arrested for gun charges six of those times. Dope. Yeah, you rap about this, that, and the <laughs> other. Sure, self defense. We got you. Right. Yeah, give him a couple of years in the cushy little place and let him go. Oh man. They weren't having that. They started off with 19 years and 16. They really wasn't budging. And my lawyer, uh, Frank DiGiacomo, hope he's all right. He had um, had a slip and fall in his bathroom. So a, a lawyer, uh, Walter Urban. A lot of people say different things about Walter. You always been straight with me, Walter. I hope you're still living good. Mm -hmm. Uh, He had to take over the case, and he talked to the supervisors, and 
He said, look, man, I got them to knock four off. They down to 12. They not going to single digits. You going go to go to trial tomorrow or, you know, whatever. I was like, look, man, let's go. So, so you went into it. What was your mentality going into it? Because I feel like you already felt like you were too late in, in your career to be doing that at that point. Like you thought that a lot of that shit maybe had was in the past in terms of the likelihood of you actually catching a case? Like did or were you still like a hundred percent in the shit to the point where you weren't that surprised? I was still in the shit. Yeah, I was still <laughs> okay. in the shit. I was still in the shit. I just didn't think I would get caught like that. Mm. You know. And you know, it was a learning lesson, you know. I I was able to go in there and, you know, recalibrate uh recalibrate and calculate my life to follow a better path right. all the way around. You feel I, like you became a much better person in there? I did. Mm. I did. I accepted Islam in there. You know, I took my Shahada. Um, like I said, I've been on the streets for over five years now. You know, I still pray five times a day. I fast every Ramadan. You know, I, I paid my zakat. Uh, you know, I got to take my hajj soon enough. And, uh, you know, I'm... I'm st- Sticking with the script, you know, me and God got a good relationship now that I needed to go in there and Mm. really form. And, you know, it's helped me in my life ever since I exited. Definitely. You feel like you just, yeah, you just grow up a lot in there in terms of just having all that time to just think about the stuff that you were doing before that. And then you just kind of came out as a different person trying to live at a different speed. Definitely. That's definitely how it happened. Mm. You know, I saw that, you know, I would get letters from france and scotland and uh you know sweden and other places i've been and you and they would be like wishing me well and telling me how much i meant to hip-hop and stuff like that and Mm. you know i wasn't getting a letter from you know too many of my homeboys or you know from from my city you know i was like damn I rep, I rep the turf pretty hard all my life, mm. you know. <laughs> Is that a weird realization when you go in to do 10 years? You realize that you feel like the people <coughs> back home don't give a fuck the same way that you thought that they would? Yeah, mm. yeah. And you know what? <coughs> Me being out here, to be honest, you know, you, you, you really get to understand out of sight, out of mind. Because the world moves so fast right now, and it, it has always <coughs> moved at a pace where if you're not really in – in the thick of it, you won't be able to grasp the momentum that's required to 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 not only sustain what you have, but to increase. So, I mean, from a legitimate platform, if you're not selling dope, if you're not robbing people, I mean, if you're living legitimately. So, you have to understand that it's the transition that you make from there to the streets, you you have to get in the system. Mm. And if you don't understand what the system is, then you're going to fall victim. The system is you being able to provide for your family, you pay your bills, you know, like you were saying a little bit earlier, you know, just living comfortably, comfortably and responsibly. Mm. You know, it's, if you want the flashy shit, you got to take the risks that come with the flashy shit. Right. You know, if you're not, you know, it's it's steps to get to where you want to get to. And if, you know, you have to know how to to progress from step to step. So I, I came to realize that from the time that the time that I was able to sit in there and reflect. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, regardless whether the city loves me as much as I would expect them to, I understand that. You know, people only believe what they see. If they don't see you, then they're not really knowing about the condition that you're in mentally, financially, you know, spiritually, whatever. But when they see you out here, then the assumptions begin. You know, it's like if they if they can't pull up right to where you live and be like, hey, look, Trady right there, there go his car, there go that and they don't see you for a while, but they see you in other platforms and doing other things, they automatically assume that you're doing much better than you might even be doing. Right. And and they and people take liberties with their assumptions. Uh-huh. So especially on like a street level, people are very quick to like make an assumption if they don't see you around or whatever that that you fell off or you, you ain't fucking with people anymore. 
You know, either or, yeah. either or, either you fell off and you hide, or you know, you done got to a level where you don't require them as friends or associates no more. Mm. You know, how does it feel though to still have that level of respect though? Because when you, if you go search Trey D on YouTube, is you doing features, doing st songs with all kinds of young dudes, largely Long Beach. It feels like that's pretty much who you fuck with is like people who came up in the same environment that you did. And it's cool actually to see that somebody like Stupid Young who realistically was not even like alive or paying attention to music for a large part of your career is that he wants to show respect and that he understands that you had an important contribution. Yeah. That's that's, that's pretty cool to see just no, that the kids still give a fuck, right? No, that's wonderful. Mm. That's wonderful that, that, you know, I get called for features and you know, a lot of features, a lot of features I turn down, Adam. Okay. You know what I mean? Because, you know, a lot of times people expect you to, you know, oh, you love hip hop, so, you know, do it for this. You know, and it's not, that's not how it goes. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And other times the music is inappropriate, you know, as far as to my standard of mm. quality. So, you know, I have to figure out a way to tell them, you know, eh, you know, it's, and I don't grab everything that comes toward me. I don't so know I, if we want to hear Trey D on like a Migos beat, right? You like something I a little more I'll West fuck Coast? Migos beat up. <laughs> hey, I was tripping. Me and wife it was different the other day, and we was listening to something. I said, you know what? I said we have killers beat right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I think our fuck amigos beat up. Right. It, okay. Because you know what? You don't hear a, a 808 and get turned off. No, hip hop is fun. Okay, that's cool. I just look at it as you know. They popping mollies, they taking <laughs> pills, they snorting lines, they right. drinking lean. You know what I mean? Does that so, turn you off to it? Nah, cause I mean, shit. I was doing shit when I was when I was in in my heyday of rapping. You know, I'm right. I'm having fun, chewing mushrooms, and all <laughs> kind of shit, and you know, everything. We was having a ball. You know what I mean? Right. You know, I don't do hair around and crack and no shit like that. But you know, pretty much everything that was in the life. You know, I, I might have dabbled in, so I can't turn around and condemn what they doing in this day and age or I'd be a hypocrite. But do you worry about it just being that you know a lot more? You know what it's like to see some young dude that your friends would turn into a junkie uh, and you see all these kids taking pills, which are a fucking perfect entryway into being a heroin addict and all this shit. Like, does it kind of worry you when you see uh, a lot of that? I don't see it that much. Oh, okay. Seriously, I don't, you know, and... If I did, you know, it would only probably concern me to the point where if I knew the person or, you know, knew somebody that I cared about that was connected to him, that <laughs> I might even broach the subject. Mm. But, you know, motherfuckers doing what they doing to feel good and get over. You know, drugs numb you for the <laughs> most part. So especially those, you know, more uh, damaging drugs, mm. you know, they, they take you to a place where, you have to want to be in that zone. You know, I, I see certain people that they do exposés on and stuff like that, and they be on crack and stuff like that, or on meth, and you see how they acting, and they not even coherent and shit like mm. that, and you're like, you want to fuck with some shit that, you know? Right. So you can't really understand the psyche. But that's kind of like, to a young kid, going out and doing all these crazy ass drugs is like, a lot, in a large part, the same reason that a young kid might want to join a gang, kill somebody, shoot somebody, whatever, is that they just want to prove that they're a man. They want to prove that they're not a little kid. They want to prove that they don't give a fuck. And, like, some kids might do that by shooting at somebody. Some kids might do that by just standing on the corner every day. Some kids might do that by just popping a whole bunch of mollies and acting crazy. Some, and, some dudes might do that by go sitting in the tattoo chair. Right, for real, getting yeah. getting sleeve from head to toe, you know. Some dudes getting, might do it by going to college and getting a good job. Shit like that, you know, that might be their way of proving that they're a man. For my dad, when I look at his life pattern, I'm like, damn, he got out of college and went and started a family and got a good job. That went right over my head. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you processed, you, your, your process was a different approach. I didn't too. even get it as a kid. I didn't even like realize that that was what I was supposed to do. I was just like, nah, I want to like, you know, go off and ride BMX bikes and do graffiti and run around and do sell drugs, do all this crazy shit. Like it never even occurred to me that like his, he was doing what got, he was, I was, I was trying to get to the same thing that he was trying to get to. He just took a very conservative, safe route. 
Dope, you know? dope. They did back then, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we were supposed to take the example from them and, you know, either improve on it or at least mimic it to a degree. And now and, those are the people I want around me. It's like somebody who's like a young yeah, professional yeah. who, like, is concerned with living a safe life, helping with a business, building something. Yeah. You know? That reckless shit you can do without telling you, you can do without. You want it to a certain extent, but I, sometimes I think that when people come around me and they feel like it's cool to be, like, doing drugs and shit and I'm just like man you really got me fucked up if you think that that's something that's gonna make me want to be around you that's the opposite of what's true that's true yeah that's true it's definitely the company you keep that even indulge like that I only knew a couple of people that would expose those habits to, to other people Them, most, most, most bad habits you try to keep hidden See, you'd think, but these days man some of these kids just wear it on their fucking sleeve they think it's like a, a badge of honor you know I don't see it. Damn, that's crazy. I'm <laughs> right. glad I don't. <clears throat> For real. I'm glad I don't. Yeah. You know. So you came home uh, from that long bid. What changes did you, like, immediately make in your life? Like, how was your lifestyle different when you came home versus uh, what, how you were living before that? Well, when I, when I came home, one of my missions was to reestablish my relationship with my children. Mm. And How many? Five. Oh. And make sure that they all understood that the time I was gone didn't make me love them no less or, you know, be concerned no less with with their upbringing and, you know, um, the direction that they would go in life. Right. And um, another, of course, was to reestablish myself in the industry mm. because I love hip-hop. And hip-hop is not something that I do because I have to do it. You know, I'm wise enough to know or have learned a few different avenues that I can pursue right now that'll be just as lucrative, if not even more. Right. But I don't have the passion for it. And this is my passion, this music. So I came and brought my own label home, Supreme Circle Music Group, and collaborated with new artists and my business partners and, you know, we made we made albums. We made dope albums. Every album I dropped since I've been home been on Supreme Circle Music Group. And we got a good working chemistry and what we're working towards and who we're building and developing and our own sound. Mm. So I'm very proud of that. So that was one of my main objectives was to reestablish myself in the business outside of remolding with my family right and you know and staying connected to god because i knew he would guide my path mm. you know if i remain sincere you know a lot of people get out they leave their bibles they the qurans and r and r like whew done with that thanks god <laughs> really know? it's like that for a lot of people <laughs> yeah yeah you know <laughs> thanks god appreciate you getting me through that yeah Damn, you that's know, funny back to smokey joe you yeah. know what i mean so you know but uh wow it worked for me, and I knew that I was confident, and I had faith that, you know, what was meant for me would take place. And now I'm, I'm into film, mm. you know, uh, got a series, Gangster, coming out, mini film right. that uh, that involves Vantage Point Vision, which is a production company, mine and my wife's, as well as um, Snoopadelic Films. He's uh he, he's he's executive producing with Ted Chung. Oh really? Yeah, and I'm working with Art Fruit Group. Oh, that's and badass. It's a uh, yeah. So you know, it was a, uh, it was something. You know, got a lot of good actors in there, and you know, it's 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 a sci-fi uh -huh. presentation. Right. You know, it's it's something. It's, it makes you think. It's like five administrations of Trump. We're into the fifth administration of Trump. Whoa! In the movie, <laughs> yeah, that, that. So you know, it's a little shit that I could tell you that it's just a, that's a mind. What you got a mind the, for it? What yeah. You well, no. This the other day, uh, oh, no. I, I literally yesterday, Trump posted this like video on Twitter that was like a, a graphic, and it was like Trump in 2020, Trump in 2024, Trump in 2028. Like he's actually making a joke out of the thing that they keep talking about in the news, where they're actually worried that he won't just leave office He'll if he loses. A dictator. I already thought that from the beginning a lot of people are worried that because you know if you're trump he's not going out 
quietly. If they tell him that they got to get out of that house, he is going to throw a fucking fit. He's going to do some crazy ass shit, especially because it's like you lose the election and you're still the president for a while before you leave the yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. So he probably pull some stunt where they got to keep him in or something. That's what I mean is a mind fuck. Right, was, yeah. You know, just thinking about his fifth administration. Oh, my God. You know, God. where we would be with, the, you know, with the immigration and Muslims. and. <laughs> Thank God know. for the term limits, yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Man, four founding fathers knew what they was doing. Uh, yeah. You know, but, I was having a conversation with my girlfriend last night, and I said, I wonder what all the dudes that I – associate with the people I'm friends with, a lot of the black guys that I know, I wonder how what they would think of a president who was like Trump in a lot of ways, but he was black. And that's kind of a crazy thing to do, imagine. You know what I think right off the top of my head? Mm. He was doing too motherfucking much. <laughs> right. I'd be like, you're doing too motherfucking much, man. Right. You, bro, come on, man. Somebody somebody know this motherfucker. Somebody, <laughs> somebody cousin or baby daddy somebody uncle got or something. Somebody know this motherfucker, man. Just Tell say him something to him. He doing too slow mm. some of that shit down, Because we had Obama. We had a nice, polite, educated black man. It's kind of crazy to imagine like an authoritarian dictator type, mass manipulator type, but... Instead of being Trump and being like ra racist, you got like a black dude. I'm like, you know, I think a lot of the fucking dudes that I know, they would like that personality type, that Vince McMahon fucking master of some ceremonies, crazy ass theatrical reality TV type guy. And I'm like, that's what's going to have the, the Democrats in trouble is if the, if the Republicans someday find the right candidate who can be that sort of dictator type. But is not someone that immediately, like with Trump, he immediately turns off most black, Hispanic, whatever people. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's plenty of white people that fuck with him, but there's a ton of white people that don't. It if, is. A ton. Know? A yeah. ton of white people don't fuck with him. No, that's not lost on uh, the general black population, I don't believe, loses sight that, you know, he's a different kind of person. You know, he's like a throwback to, you know, the racist ideologies that was pushed in the, you know, the, the, the doctrines, you know, the secret society shit they got going on. You can see him involved in all that kind of shit. You know what I'm saying? Because he don't give a fuck who he offend. Mm. You know, it's like, you know, I'm here. And plus, he's old now, you but know. But that is the part of his personality that I could see a lot of the rapper dudes and shit that I know really embracing if he wasn't so outwardly racist. To, the, go back and listen to some of them, them rap songs. Uh, uh, Raekwon, give it up for him. The, he got a song right. called oh, yeah, remember, Trump. Yeah. You Mac know Miller saying? had a song about Trump. Fucking all kinds of everybody. Like, like until he became president, people forget how well-liked he was by the community because in hip-hop, people like a businessman. They like a self-made man. They like somebody who you know, is rich and, and presents themselves as a boss, a deal-maker, whatever. And that's one thing. When I look at Trump, I just wish that he could be who he is without being so fucking offensive to such a huge percentage of people. Like, you know, if you could just tone down the rhetoric, I wouldn't find you nearly but as is offensive. It rhetoric, <laughs> well, right, exactly. Is or is it, it just his whole personality? Yeah, is it rhetoric? <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You know, you, you have to you have to occupy a level of compassion and empathy and um, sympathy you know, per se, and <coughs> grasp the perspective of the other person. You know what I'm saying? It's not just your way, your deal. This is not a, this is not a, you know, it's not a business. We're not brokering deals and, you know, uh, cutting off supply chains and shit like that, man. Don't run this shit. Run this shit like we all are people and we all need to get along and understand each other first and foremost. If he went back on half of the shit that he been spitting out there, I think I think motherfuckers would start fucking with Trump. Right. I think if he really, really like said, look, man, you know, this what it is, man. Damn all these advisors and shit like this. This where I'm at with it. You know what I'm saying? On immigration, this what the situation is. I don't got nothing against He obviously don't got nothing against Muslims because he fucking with uh, uh, MBS mm. over there. The one who supposed to knock off Khashoggi. All right, yeah, You yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? He They tighten the motherfucker. Yeah. You know, he trying to, he trying to get deal to Saudis like 
how, however many billions of dollars worth of arms. I mean, I think he's corrupted by the Russians for sure. Like he he's he's he doesn't act as if he's somebody. That I think that's a big part of what people don't like about him is that, and in particular, like this audience that we're talking about of like you know urban young people or whatever, is that they value loyalty a lot, and he doesn't seem loyal to his country. And no. that's part of the problem is he, see, he seems so quick to defend North Korea or Russia when he could just be like, like he does take an America first stance on a lot of stuff. But mm -hmm. then at the same time, he cowers like a little pussy to Putin and to all these different people that he really has. Like, it's not obvious to me what the reason should be. It makes me feel like he's corrupt. Well, I, I believe that back in the days when he was doing them Amer Miss America pageants and things like that. Walking around and, in the dressing room? Yeah, when they... <laughs> Looking they, at all the girls. And, and, you know, they had wild parties in Russia back then. Oh, you know, God, yeah. When you go to, yeah. When you go to Russia, they was legendary. I read about them. Mm. You know what I mean? And, you know, they probably got him going in the room with an underage girl or something like that. And, you know, she probably didn't look underage or whatever. He, they probably got him off that vodka. Mm. And, you know, who knows? I ain't calling him nothing. I'm not calling him a pedophile. I'm not calling him none of that. But but I'm, you don't even have to guess because we know that he was cheating on his wife with porn stars, which is, you know, from my perspective, it's it's not that crazy. But from my, from the average American's perspective, there's no similar thing that you could compare that any president has done before in terms of like just being a slut, basically being a fucking wild ass dude. Man, I thought he wasn't gonna get in when he they caught him saying grab him by the oh, pussy. Oh, I thought it was over. As I fuck. thought it was. I thought it, with women so you know so vocal in this country and you know and then and you know thank God you know they they gain in their place in politics and things like that 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 was so offensive to just be you supposed to be regal. Right. And, and, and as when we grew up, well, when I grew up, I could say that, you know, you looked at the president, even if you didn't agree with his politics, you looked at him as somebody that could handle any situation that needed to be handled based on the betterment of the country. Right. It seemed like if it don't suit him or suit his needs or his idea of, you know, what he should, what agenda he should be pushing. It's like, man, I don't give a fuck about what y'all talking about. Mm. That's not presidential. Yeah. That's why they say he's not presidential. There's something that happens with every president when they get into office where as soon as you get elected, it's not the Democrats versus the Republicans. We're all Americans. And he, I remember when he gave his speech as soon as he was elected, that he came out and gave a speech that very much was him trying to be that like bigger person say we're going to all come together as Americans and then has completely not shown that at all since like he's constantly making it the left versus the right blah 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 the the enemy the, of the of the the, the press etc yeah and he i mean wow for that yeah that declaring the, the press as fake media that's scary that shit was yeah that was the path to dictatorship mm. That's kind of like the beginning path to dictatorship. You know, you study, not really even study, but you go read books and they make mention of Marx and Lenin and, you know, things like that, you know. And it's like you, Mussolini, you know, you, you, you kind of like note Stalin. They, they, was, they was pushing the, this is for statehood. We, this, this is going to be the directive, and this is what everybody's going to follow. And it seems like that's kind of like the, the, you know, <clears throat> the direction that he's pushing. Yeah, yeah, and it, it feels like a lot of people who should be better than to support Trump support him just for the fact that he is the enemy of the media, of the leftists, of the of the socialists, of all the things that a lot of people hate. It's like they're just willing to get on his side because they don't like the other side. And that it's just straight up become teams. Even if the leader of, you know, like, even if the leader of the gang is a fucking idiot in Trump's case, it's like you still, shit, if he's cool with you and he's going to be fucking going to war against your enemies, then you got to saddle up with him. And I understand it. Mm. I do. That's politics, not only politics. What is the Democrats really offering, you know, in in you know, in contrast to that? Right. You know, it's like who do you really got that's gonna step up and really push a line for the country that's you know, that's that has those characteristics that I was talking about, it's regal, that's you know, uh, strong, that has a good background, that you know, is that that shows in his 
history of politics, he's always voted and stood for the right causes and right things. You don't have that. You you have settled politics now. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, are we going to settle for this one or settle for that one? And, the, you know, the Republicans pretty much like shit. This is what we got. We got our position to, you know, to, to really dictate how this country is ran right now. Fuck it. If he's an idiot, we'll just try to get shit by this idiot. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And hopefully he'll fuck with us on it. We'll show strong allegiance to him and hopefully he'll push our agendas through and our platforms he'll be able to, uh, you know, support and and, you know, damn it, if the Democrats get it back, then they get it back. But who's, I don't see anybody over there that powerful to really come in and, and make it. Then you got the, the gay dude, you know what I'm saying? And he, You know, it's like, come on. I mean, I'm not really against what they do, but I mean, what we gonna have? Two best men in the country? Yeah. You know, the, the best man and the first man. The Does that worry you? The, <laughs> I'm not shit, man. God gonna do what He do, man. When it's His time to do it, if mm. it, if it start going too much like that, you know, yeah, I'm gonna be worried. But <laughs> yeah, on the real, but that shit is nuts, man. You know, you are gonna have the 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 the, the, the president and the and the first man mm. in the country. That's and I'm, that's not a woman. I'm not as worried president. about that as I'm worried about the the idea that the Democrats are going to get so they just keep getting deeper and deeper into their weird ass identity politics bullshit focusing on weird social agendas that the average American doesn't care about because if you want to win this fucking election you got to get the middle of America to to turn their back on Trump and align themselves with somebody who's more left leaning and you're not going to get there by focusing in on like trans bathroom issues and shit the you're average not, american i'm guaranteeing you trade do not give a fuck about that and you're probably a lot more like the average fucking person in the middle of america picking who they're going to vote for those people are worried about pretty basic shit they're worried about their jobs the economy safety in their neighborhoods and shit and somehow trump managed to speak to those things they are worried about immigration and shit like that and trump manages to fucking rise all those people up regardless of how he gets there if the democrats could find a way to show that they care about that kind of issue mm-hmm. without being a fucking monster like him right then they'd be winning in my opinion yeah but I, and i'm not really worried about you know that kind of you know that kind of image being presented to the point where i would even let that deter my vote if that if he was a candidate that embodied all those things that you just spoke mm. about at the same time out of the field of 20 that the democrats have i haven't really seen one that stood out he's the most you know that he's like the most visible mm. like one of the most visible in the beta old rug dude and the kamala harris and all that and it's like uh, and uh, Joe Biden is still the most well-ranked one, and he's also the most middle of the road. He's not on some crazy woke shit. He's very much middle of the road, conservative or middle uh, center left, as opposed to being like a far left candidate. So that's that's a big part of the problem that that Democratic infighting that they're going to have because Joe Biden is not going to be sufficiently w- left for a lot of people in that world. Right. They're gonna, but I think that that is probably the kind of candidate that could beat trump obama's homie you know yeah yeah he'd he probably be one of the closest not unless you know not unless somebody else came up with a great track record and all that because he's being questioned on a lot of things they was just clamoring for him to apologize the other day about praising segregation and right, saying yeah. you know oh yeah they you know, he never called me boy <laughs> and you know he always treated me like a man yeah you ain't black he what he gonna call you boy for he gonna treat you like he treats you he gonna treat you like one is everybody a lot of other motherfuckers got called boy and a whole lot worse mm. but you know, it's just little shit like that they got to pick at and then with him, with the women and shit, yeah. you know, they gonna come back up, you know, saying, you know, the inappropriate touching and all that and, you know, the creepy shit, but... That's the problem. All these Democrats are gonna be going to war with each other and meanwhile, Trump is gonna be focused on just trying it. to bring you all these people it. together you for him. <clears throat> but meanwhile, all these Democrats are ripping each other to shreds. You see it. And it's only gonna get so much worse as we get closer to the election. Yeah, it is. It Terrifying. Is. <laughs> yeah, you said. Yeah, he's 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 definitely on the path to becoming the dictator. No oh, man, and it goes so deep that I I um, I even think that he might be the antichrist. Really? 
it's a possibility. What do you mean when you he, say that? If if he spelled his last name, his middle name Joseph. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. DJT. Don, yeah, Donald Joseph Trump. And you know, German, Germanic spelling probably of Trump would include an F at the end. You know what I mean? So that's the sixth letter right there. Oh, you know, okay. that's just something that I just processed on my own. Ooh, 666. Six, six. There you go. Yeah, so it's definitely a possibility with all the wild things going on around the world. I ran brazenly attacking shit and going to pick up the shells that didn't go off. <laughs> they was a damn fool for that, man. And, you know, they just knocked the drone down, yeah. you know. And it's like, you know, it's, it's going to have to be some type of response. So then attention going to be diverted over there and he either going to look strong or weak by how he responded. If he come out strong, you know, shit, they not going to take no weak ass Democrat to, 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 to put him out and try their new recipe. Mm. They not going to do that shit. That's, That's so true, yeah. Huh. Crazy shit. Well, hey, we've been on here for an hour and 20 minutes. What you got going on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> what yeah. you got coming up? <laughs> oh, man, you know, just like I say, the film, the gangster film, got that coming up. I just dropped an album a couple months ago called The Certified Project, showcasing my label and, you know, what we do over there. Uh, it's on Supreme Circle Music Group. Um, also, I got my son, Rock's Brand. Uh, meant to smoke some of that in here, but we was already on the air. <laughs> oh, it's, it's kill. I'll make sure I leave you with some of that. Okay. And uh, you know, we got the um, we got we got the shows coming up. We're gonna start doing a few shows. Um, actually, we lining up with this uh, promotion company. We're gonna start bringing more hip hop shows to the west coast you know a lot of times people be scared to book venues and things like that but when you connect it to the streets you're more able to make street events happen because you know the right people to holler at and you know interact with and build with to make things happen to where it's no danger Definitely. so yeah we're gonna we're gonna start doing that um also Free DW Flame, waiting on him to touch down. You know, he's one of our new artists. He's making a lot of noise. He got scooped up by the feds. He's been gone like a year and a half. He might only have a few more months to do. Okay. Um, making sure that go right. Uh, a whole lot of things in there. Got our podcast, you know, we do every Monday called Third Degree Radio. On oh, Dash shit, Radio. I didn't realize that. On the Native Rhyme Channel, myself, my wife, Coney, Actor XO, and Guy Tory, and DJ Cell. Okay. Uh, you know, every Monday live from 10 to 12 a.m. Hey, you ever want to get me on there? I'll promote it, promote the uh, fuck out of it. Dope, dope, dope. We're going to set that up. That'd be yeah, lit, man. Yeah, I, just did, uh, I just did it with Be Real, the smoke box thing. Yeah. And I just did a, a Crooked a Eyes smoke podcast. smoke box fun as a That was fun, right? <laughs> yeah. You get really high in there. Yeah, what? You, high, what? Like, it's a and real high Make sure you get high because they, they supply you with the right thing. And people smoke. don't know that they put, like, a fucking big-ass blanket over the windows. Oh, and then you got God. the guys in back smoking and you got at least four blunts or, or joints going all at the same time that is Gas. you get really Gas. high in there yeah, you even do. if you think you smoke Shout a lot of weed you get real. high in there shout out be real yeah i fuck with be real real tough man him man real said tough. dog shout out to cypress shout out to them for getting they walk they start on the walk of fame Facts. you know on the real shout out to snoop Dogg for getting his on the walk of fame them real big moments of hip-hop uh -huh. you know shout out to ice cube you know what i mean it's, it's gigantic, man. We started to be recognized after so long of people thinking that it was just a flash in the pan, you know, really making an impact, being the biggest selling genre of music in the world mm. from making records and, and projects and, and coming out and rocking, you know, uh, parties in the, in the little courtyards and things like that to being so big, man, you know, want to want to shout out everybody who made that happen. The pioneers and the young dudes still making it crack. Uh, I yeah. fuck with all good hip hop, and some of that new shit is pretty good, man. I like I like most of the Migos shit. I like Future. I like Yellow Beezy. There's a lot of know? shit in L. A. coming out right now, which wasn't necessarily PG, true Perico. for a while, but now, yeah, yeah, Perico we had on a couple years ago. Yeah, that's dope. Hell that's yeah. dope. Yeah. Shoreline Mafia is my uh, my recommendation. Right. They hold it down. Blueface blew the fuck up real fast. 
overnight. Roddy Rich too is all. Roddy actually, we Rich. got Blueface and Roddy Rich on the Double XL Freshman cover, which is a uh, is a good thing for LA. Oh, y'all doing the Freshman cover? Uh, the Double XL one. They oh. just put out the cover the other day. Uh huh. And I think I think those are the only two LA rappers, but. Oh, still, I gotta get that. That's still I pretty enjoy good. Reading that. Two Crips on the cover. Yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's definitely an accomplishment. We love that as well. <laughs> right, you know, yeah. They, they, they try to act like the Crips didn't have any stars for a minute, but they, it definitely don't feel like that right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But well, that certified project banging too. You know, we got uh we got my young DJ uh uh Fresh, he do some production on there. We got Eric Lee, we're about to drop his album as well with five hundred hertz called Legend Born. Um got Cognac the XO showing off on there as well. Her and Cola Loke did a song as well on there as her doing her thing all over it. Um man, we just we just got in there and had a ball, man. DW Flame went crazy on it. And uh we just pushing, man, just trying to make sure everybody support good music and, and know we ain't never going to come with no bullshit, man. That's the Supreme Circle motto, man. Respect. Well, yeah, man, it was awesome getting to talk to you uh, for the first time. We should do it again sometime. You too, man, whenever. You're going to come to our show. Let's do That's it. That's what we're going to set up. For sure. Yeah. That's dope. For sure. Appreciate All you, right. man. Off top, brother. Good times. Thank Off you, top. G. Yep. Everybody out there, Trey D, East Siders, Long no Beach, worries, you already know. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, and subscribe. And we out.